Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the important work of Latino community foundations and helping Latino communities in the United States prosper with special guest Carlos Martinez, President and CEO of the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado. And I'd like to thank you uh, for joining us, Carlos. It is so great to have you here. I find this particular topic so interesting because if you look at American history, Latin Hispanic cultures and peoples and interactions have really had this huge effect, but it's kind of a buried history. So if you just sort of take a look at the numbers, right, uh, people of uh, Latin and Hispanic descent are an increasing portion of the U.S. population. And according to the Pew Research Center, they comprise 62.5, you comprise 62.5 million Americans in the United States in 2021. And it's having just a huge impact on the country, but we can go all the way back, right? To the beginnings, to the pre-colonial days of American history, right? So talk a little bit about the perspective of someone from the Latin Hispanic community as part of this nation and the building of this nation and your perspective as the leader of the Latin Community Foundation of Colorado in advancing the interests of the community. So thanks for having me, Mark. I appreciate that. Um, I can just uh, share with you my own family history. My great-great-grandfather helped to build the railroads from Kansas out to the West. Um, my Which, grandfather- what years, was, the, what years was that? That was the early that was 1800s? The, that was like in the 1880s. Um, my grandfather was part of the uh, Bracero program um, during World War II that came here to go ahead and 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 help with the agriculture here of, of the United States and so forth. And then my parents came here in, in, the, in, in 1960 um, to find a better place for them and for their children. And so in my own family, we've had those stories about our, my family coming here over the past, you know, 150 years, contributing to the growth of, of the United States um, and to where it's now. Um, so I think a lot of us have those connections. And I think some folks sometimes think we're just new arrivals, um, but we've helped build this country for, for centuries now. Well, and your, your great-great-grandfather, I guess, in 1880, predated my uh, grandparents who came in as uh, immigrants in, uh, at the turn of the century, the 1900s, and then, and then in 1937. So this whole idea of, of the origins of the country is, is, is interesting because the origins of country come from, yes, it comes from Germany and, and England, but also from Africa and uh, Central and South America. The origins of the country come from Japan and they come from Korea and they come from all over the world, right? Yes. Um, and I think that's, at least for me, you know, that's the beauty of where, you know, of this country, um, that it, we had people from all over the world who has made it what it is today. Um, and I think here in Colorado also, the Latino community goes back many, many generations. As we all know, Colorado used to be part of Mexico before. Um, and so in Colorado today, we have uh, Latinos who identify themselves from folks who've been here for 10 generations or longer. We have folks who are more recent immigrants, um, those recent immigrants from Mexico or from Central or South America or even the Caribbean. Um, we, we have a very mix of folks here in Colorado right now. Um, we're about 22% of the population. Um, we're, we are expected to grow to be one third of the population in about 20 years. And in about 30 years, we're looking to be about 45% of the workforce. So when you look at the growth of Colorado, how it's evolving, how it's unfolding, Latinos will continue to play a major role in the sp prosperity of the state. It's pretty amazing. So the first organized, uh, truly organized settlement of Latin Hispanic peoples in Colorado came in 1851 
Mm-hmm. Right? But if you just take a look at the at at um, at the migration patterns and people who have been in this country and in that area of the world, um, it, re- it really goes back for hundreds and hundreds of, of years, right? Absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely. And um, I think you know the the work that we do here at the foundation um, takes us through uh, not all corners of Colorado, but to a lot of places throughout Colorado. And it's it, it's just beautiful to learn the history and the richness of, of folks coming here, especially the uh, Latinos who were here before this was even the United States. As they say, the border crossed us, we didn't cross the border um, because of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Um, but um, to see kind of like our, our state, um, how it's unfolding, how it's growing, um, where Latinos are in Southern Colorado, in the mountain region, in the Western Slope, or up in the uh, uh, n- uh, northern part of the state, um, and of course here in Denver, um, is, is just beautiful to see that diversity of, of folks. Um, and, you know, starting coming together. I mean, I, I think there's, you know, I really see folks coming together, um, building up their voice, amplifying that voice, and along with uh, building that voice is also building their power. Um, Because when you look at it, a lot of our newer immigrants from Central and South America or even the Caribbean have been coming here probably for the last 25 to 30 years. So it's not a long time. Um, And so as they're coming in and how they're getting settled now and they're having children, how they're uh, engaging and interacting with other Latinos who have been here for, uh, for a longer time, um, and having those, building those relationships, how that really contributes to having a stronger Latino community. You know, I, I want to talk a little bit about this whole idea of multiculturalism, because one of the things that that we're seeing unfolding in this country is this struggle about whether multiculturalism is a good thing or a bad thing, right? Multi-ethnic, multiracial, multilingual, and, and so on. What is your take about the, this idea of America as a, as a multicultural, not a melting pot where everybody sort of becomes one thing, they melt, all the difference melts together and so on, but instead a melting pot in the sense of a beautiful stew where they're, you know, a gumbo of different flavors and, and so on. How do you see this question about multiculturalism unfolding in a place like Colorado? For me, I think that's a great thing. Um, and I can just tell you that growing up, I, I was raised with the philosophy of that melting pot that you were talking about. Um, and, and basically, it's telling you, you need to strip away these other parts of who you are and part of your identity. I am never going to be able to strip the fact that I'm, you know, of Mexican origin. Why would you want to? Exactly. Want to. Okay. But the melting pot is like, you got to strip all that away yeah. and you have to become this one soup, as you're saying. But I think that multiculturalism is bringing, you know, the best of, of the whole of who you are. Okay. And if I'm going to be around a table of decision makers who are thinking through um, and about making, you know, decisions about how our society is evolving and growing and we have different perspectives that allow people to be apart. When you allow people to belong, they will contribute a lot more than when they feel that they don't belong. And belonging is key. And I think our societies are looking for that at all levels of people belonging, not just be, um, people of color, but also uh, white Americans also are looking for a sense of a place of belonging. How do we create these multicultural societies where everybody feels that they belong, where they can contribute, where they can grow, where they can raise families, um, safe communities, um, they can prosper economically. Those are the kind of things that, you know, we're all looking for, Um, but we create them when everyone is engaged, not a certain part of the population, but when everybody has a voice at the table. So how do we create this sense of shared ownership for the benefits of multiculturalism as opposed to alienation, right? We sometimes um, have seen where uh, people of Latin Hispanic descent have been 
marginalized and sidelined from um, from certain jobs or from certain positions or from certain influence, right? We see this also this fear of this this happening um, with with people who are opposing this idea of multiculturalism or or uh, bilingualism. You know, uh, teaching Spanish, for example. Um, how do we bridge that gap so that people of Latin Hispanic uh, origin um, have absolutely an equal stake at the table. So does everyone else. Everybody is sitting around and enjoying this beautiful meal together, sharing each other's cultures. How do we diminish the fear and the separation while ensuring that the country remains very strong and cohesive? I think simply we start off by just coming together and having conversations. And I think that's, we, we don't even want to do that, I think, sometimes. You know, well, you know we're just, we're, just talking we're, to each other, like doing what yeah. we're doing here. Well, exactly. Um, because, you know, m- many times we're just have these preconceived notions that if if you're this way, well, then I can't really associate with you. I'm too different or, you know, we don't have anything in common. Um, but the fact is always we have more things in common than we don't have. Um, and by learning um, and understanding is how then we end up, you know, starting to to move in the direction that we need to. But oftentimes now, it's you know we put everything has become so politicized, and not just politicized, but politicized to the event that you're either on one side or the other. There's only two sides. That's it. One side or yeah, the who other. Who would think that that education would be such a political uh, hot potato? How do you deal with? Uh, t- let's talk a little bit about your programs. Um, because probably everything that you're doing could be viewed for, through a political lens, but you're really not trying to engage in party politics. You're you're really trying to engage in um, capacity building, in in education, and in, in, talk a little bit about the programs that you advance sure. at the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado. Sure, I, you know, and I think when um, so we don't provide any direct services as a foundation. We support different nonprofits, community leaders, but I think what we start also with the premise also is that as we work with folks, we're not just working about today, but we're helping people see tomorrow, twenty years from now, thirty years. I gave you some some numbers where when we're you know in twenty years we'll become one third of the population. It's not about you know, oh, let's wait till 20 years from now and then we'll, but it's like, what can we start doing today? How do we start changing that mindset of that leader who is not thinking just about today, but is thinking about tomorrow? Um, What are the kind of things you're putting into place? The kind of mindset, the kind of thinking that allows us to build economic prosperity in our communities, that allows our children to have a, a great education, that allows us to be able to live in safe uh, neighborhoods. These are the kind of conversations we need to start having and thinking now, not 20 years from now. And so what our foundation tries to do is tries to really look at, let's look at the big picture. Aren't you, now, aren't you also talking about me, right? A white guy, right? Yeah. I want to live in a safe neighborhood. I want to, I want to have employees who are productive. I want to work for people who are innovators, right? I mean, isn't it important for me that, for example, the next Latin Hispanic entrepreneur who's going to invent some new idea that they get to employ me, right? Yes. And 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 we can basically create a thriving Colorado together. Aren't you actually trying to advance? by advancing a particular community that has perhaps not received the kind of attention that it needs, aren't you also trying to solve a bigger problem than just a particular group that's 20%? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the conversations that we end up having, not just within our community and the Latino community, but outside of the Latino community also, is about how do we ensure, okay, the progress, the innovation, of this state, because it, when when you exclude one third of your population and they're not able to go ahead and really engage, you're not going to be a prosperous state. 
Well, you're also being kind of, you're you're shooting yourself in the foot, right? Well, exactly. Right. So I think we start with that premise with a lot of the work that we do about, let's think about today, but let's think about tomorrow as well. So a lot of our work is centered around capacity building. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's capacity building of our leaders, our, our executive directors of nonprofit organizations, community leaders. It's focused on the nonprofits themselves as well. And lastly, it's also um, focused on communities. And so we look at capacity building in, in ways that meets people where they're at. Um, a lot of foundations sometimes don't fund capacity building, or most of the times they don't, they fund programs. But the ones that sometimes provide capacity building uh, uh, grants and so forth, sometimes will fund you if you're at a point where they think you need to be in order to be invested in. What we say is we invest in you where you're at, uh, not where you where we want you to be at, because um, we also know that they take some time to get there. But there's so much talent out there. There's so many, you know, we also look at everyone's a leader. Some people just haven't had the opportunity to unleash it. But so, money isn't infinite. How do you make a determination as to making an investment here or making an investment there? You've well, got to make some hard decisions, right? Well, we do. But you know what? I think is the, the, the big thing also that we've learned also, we don't lead with money. Okay. We lead with relationships. Okay. And we and we lead with being a community thought partner. So you That's lead with community, we, not necessarily with dollars. No. So the dollars can come later. And right now we're, uh, we're, you know, we're referred to sometimes as a managing foundation or operating foundation. So we don't have an endowment. So all the money that we invest in the community on an annual basis, we have to raise. So we have to raise our operating dollars and we have to raise our, our investment dollars. So why would I invest in you? Why don't I just invest directly? Is it because you have expertise that I don't have? Well, and um, that's part of it. But the other thing, the added value that we have, okay, is that you may invest in an organization, give them a grant, and then you really don't have any follow through till about a year later when that report comes to you and you try to make something out of the report. Um, What we do is we invest, but the relationship is the number one. We're on the journey of where that organization wants to go into you know, we, we, we have that ongoing relation. We support them. We, aside from the dollars, we provide coaching, um, advisement, uh, mentoring, um, connect them to other opportunities as well. Um, and so we help them look at the big, the, our nonprofits look at a bigger picture and know that they can come here for support where sometimes they don't see that or they don't have that through other foundations. And so we we look at kind of like the long-term investment where sometimes foundations may just give for one or a couple of years and, and that's it. Um, but we really look at the long-term investment, especially when we're looking out 20 years from now of how do we ensure that we build these um, organizations up, we build these um, leaders up as well as communities. Can we can we talk a little bit about the um, the uh, nature of the Latin Hispanic community in Colorado? Uh, because first of all, the state is incredibly diverse. You have that sort of part, that stripe in the center of Colorado where you have the population density, uh, which is uh, running uh, Boulder, Denver, you know that that whole mm-hmm. center part of Colorado. Then you have. The mountain regions, you've got um, uh, agricultural regions and so on. There are different needs. And then if you then overlay on that the fact that uh, Latin Hispanic culture is incredibly diverse itself, right, with with people from different lived experiences, even um, more recent immigrants having connection to uh, to different uh, traditions and, and homes and so on. How do you serve this incredibly diverse uh, community and do justice to people not only living in cities but also those that are a little bit more difficult to serve in 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 remote areas just logistically more difficult to serve how do you do that so you know I, I think what's been really helpful is um when so we were incubated under another foundation and then went finally independent on our own five years ago 
when we did that, which was before COVID, we created an infrastructure that we could operate anywhere in the state. So we were, you know, it didn't matter where we're at, we can go in and just pop open our, our laptop and we can do business anywhere. So you were, you were prepared for this virtual world that we're operating in from the very beginning. Yes, exactly. Um, because we kind of like saw ourselves as a pop-up foundation. We can just pop up anywhere and, and do business because at the core of everything for us was relationships. Okay. And it's not necessarily that we have to give out money or in order to have a relationship, it's based upon money. It's based up, it's based upon, I understand you. How can I help you? Even if it's just to talk something through or to connect you to someone else but I'm here to support you, but it may not be through dollars. Um, but I'm on your, I'm here with you on your journey. And I think that's what really has set us apart um, from our foundation and others is that we're really relational, not transactional. Um, we're about helping you over time, not just a certain amount of time. And we're here to help you think things through. I mean, it is wonderful when you give, you know, when we have a grantee who calls up and says, Carlos, you know what? This is not going that well. Um, can I talk through it? And maybe we can think something differently because I thought this was going to, you know, happen and so forth. And but didn't quite go our way. And we, and we talk it through and we make adjustments because nothing in life is perfect. And I think sometimes what I, I have trouble with is sometimes... Um, our, our sector puts together the puts together these theories of change that sometimes are not really based upon how a community is structured, how a community's lived experiences are, but yet we make a grant based on a theory of change that we want to prove is either right or not. Um, and I say, let the communities create their own theories of change. You know, this is really this is really interesting, Carlos. You know, I'm a I've been a business consultant for uh, much of my career. Uh, I've gone on to to work with nonprofits and with, but I've done I've done a lot of I've done corporate work. I've done international work and so on. What you're saying is so important because what you're saying is that for all my technical expertise in this or that area, I'm not necessarily the person who is equipped to do what you're doing in those circumstances, no matter what my technical expertise is, what you're saying is you have to combine the technical expertise with the cultural competency, the lived experience, the trust, there are other ingredients that make it work. And it's not just one thing. So in that particular case, language, the fact that I don't speak Spanish, I speak other languages, right. but the, spa the fact that I don't speak, the fact that I look the way I, I am, the fact that I'm a guy, right? Maybe the the right person is a woman, or maybe it's it's somebody of uh, of, you know who identifies as uh, you know in some other way, right? Those aspects are part of success. They're just as important as the technical competencies, right? Absolutely. And the other thing is how you enter community. You know, we talk about that a lot. It's like you know when we get invited or we go to a community, we meet with a community or community members. What, what do usually foundations do? They show up, they sit down, they pop open their laptop, and they're ready, we're ready to begin and take notes. First of all, that could be very intimidating for community members who've never met with foundations. Right. What are they writing? What are they talking about me? When we meet with community, we don't, if we're going to end up even taking notes on a piece of paper, we ask for permission first. So you have, you have this, this, this distributed thing where you can use laptops and so on and so forth, but your approach is different going in. Totally. And totally because scaled to, to the people that you're serving. And then you have this long-term commitment. So it's not transactional, right? You won't necessarily come in with a checkbook. No, no. And there and done, right? No, ex exactly. And once we have a relationship with you, and then we're going to, you know, let's say we decide to make a grant to you, we're not asking you to fill out, you know, 20 pages, uh, 
you know, of all these documents we need, plus the narrative, plus your logic model or your, you know, what are your outcomes and everything? Because you and I have already had a relationship. I know you, I know your board. I, you've introduced me to community members. They've talked to me, you know, you know, are you really a leader in your community in an authentic way and, and so forth? So we're not asking for a lot of documents because we have a relationship with you. Uh, and we do that. And so a couple of years ago, aside from grant making, we started, uh, well, last year we launched a, um, a um, loan program. Um, because during COVID, what a lot of our nonprofit uh, executive directors were saying is, if we base this on previous experiences with uh, crisis, we usually never have working capital. Um, and we need, if, if we're gonna have to rebuild after COVID, we need access to working capital. So they said, you know, can you start a loan program? I'm like, well, I've never done a loan program before, but let me explore it. Luckily, you know, we, we did it, explored it. I was able to raise $3 million and we launched the loan program where we're giving loans from 10,000 to 250,000 from zero to 2% interest. And we start off by getting to know you and the project first and so forth. And we have conversations um, so that what we don't want to do is make this like an intimidating type of bank loan that you usually go to. And it's like, oh, my God, I have to provide this and all this and all that. But we already know from our leaders, you know, are they able to uh, to implement what they're saying or not? And, and, and sometimes you're like, we'll do this, but we're also here for you. So, you know. Keep us abreast. Let us know what you're doing so we can help you. If things become challenging, reach out to us. Because our thing is to make you be successful, not to put more roadblocks in your way, not to go ahead and do a lot more reporting. But how do we ensure the success of your leadership? Because by doing that, you will go ahead and lift up your communities. And if your communities are lift up, they have more opportunity um, to be productive citizens. And such, an important, such an important uh, 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 set of tasks and such a great, great contribution to the state of Colorado. Carlos Martinez, President and CEO of the Latino Community Foundation of Colorado. Thank you so much for sharing this approach of engaging, of respecting, of collaborating, and making it not just about the transaction or the money, but really about sustained empowerment and uplift of, of a community and service to an entire state. It's just such a pleasure to, to uh, learn from you. And thanks so much for sharing. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it.